Every day you come to work, treat the business like it was your own business. And if you treat the business like it was your own business, people will recognize that and you will do well and you will move up. And, and, and I did that right from the get go. When I, you know, I, I treated the business like it was my own business. That's how much I cared about it. And whether it was delivering papers or cutting grass or working for Domo or McDonald's or whatever, treat the business like it was your own. Hello, everybody. This is the Winning in Winnipeg podcast, where I talk to top performing business owners, executives, entrepreneurs, and local Winnipeg celebrities. I get to learn who they are and how they think, and I get to hear their perspective about what's really going on in Winnipeg and in their businesses. On today's podcast, we have the founder and owner of the Chamois Car Wash, Dave Watson. The first Chamois location opened in 1998 and since has become a staple here in Winnipeg. With three locations throughout the city and having overcome the 2008 financial crisis, as well as the devastation of COVID, the chamois is truly standing the test of time. But despite the success under Dave's leadership, the chamois has remained committed to meeting the same standards of quality and affordability. Dave Watson is absolutely crushing it in the Winnipeg business scene, and I'm so excited to dive into his story here. Thanks for being here. I really appreciate no it. No problem. Happy you told to be here. me that this is your first time, first podcast? Yeah, I have done very few interviews over the years, to be honest with you. I yeah. mean, the odd little thing here and there, but I'm I'm certainly not um, somebody who's uh, used to doing this type of thing. But, uh, you know, I'll do my best. We'll muddle through it and we'll see how things go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, no, no that sounds great. Yeah. Uh, first things first. Yes. Your unlimited exterior wash package. Yes has been a godsend for my business and my trucks. So not only mine, uh, but I'm buying it for my guys as well. And, and all of our trucks, it definitely is a game changer. I think it's awesome. When did that come? Did I just hear about it late or has it been something that's been around? Well, the, the, um, the unlimited plans originated in, um, us a number of years ago. And the idea was that if you have enough people from a business perspective, if you have enough people on your plan uh, to even out the costs of the of the frequency of how often people use them, then it you know it uh, it can be um, a reasonably good money maker. Um, you know, if you have a whole month of rain, you know, at the beginning of the month, you got X amount of dollars coming in, regardless of whatever. That's right. The downside of it, from a business point of view, is it pushes your average ticket down because now people are washing more often. That's right. So instead of people paying for every wash, they're washing, uh, you know, three or four or five times or six times a month on average or whatever. That's right. So it's a bit of a mixed bag and it's something we're just playing with right at the moment. Yeah. And sort of watching how the market goes. And because we put a lot of labor into vehicles, we're not just an exterior wash. We put a ton of labor into vehicles and labor is really expensive. Mm-hmm. It's a little more costly for us to run these kind of programs. So we're just doing some test marketing right now to see how it goes. And, uh, you know, we'll sort of watch it and see what happens. But the, I, I can tell you this, the people that are on it love it. They love it. They absolutely love it. Like uh, What you said, I've heard that from a number of customers. Now, whether it's actually making money for us, well, that's a different issue. But, that's right. Yeah. But people love it. Yeah. yeah. You know? Well, the predictable recurring revenue yes. definitely makes the valuation yes. of your companies go up. And that's what's happened in the car wash business in the last 10 or 12 years in general, maybe 15 even. A lot of car wash chains, especially bigger ones in the U.S., um, are going after that reoccurring revenue like everybody is. That's right. You know, all kinds of stuff. You see um, uh, plan members for um, book clubs. Well, book clubs always had them, but but many, many different things. Yep. And it's and that drives the value of the stock up in these big companies because it's that's reoccurring right. revenue. Yeah. Well, you can, we see it in, uh, in, in, uh, TV services. Yeah. yeah it's all subscription based. Right. Netflix, you name it, everybody. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting when you start diving into kind of the, the factors that, you know, VCs or, or whoever's looking at your valuation will, uh, right. will look at what skyrockets, uh, the value of a company versus yeah. it not being worth much. And the car wash industry is, is interesting because there, there's not. Other than your major oil companies, there's no national chains of car washes. 
Mm -hmm. There's regional chains of car washes. So even in the U.S., if you look at like Dallas, will have somebody strong in in the Southwest, you know, and and then New York area, there'll be somebody who's strong in the Northeast and that, and they build these things. But typically in the car wash business, there's no national chains. There are some large companies, Mm -hmm. but no national chains. Like there's no McDonald's of the car wash industry. That's right. No such thing. Why do you think that is? Very hard to run and operate. Okay. So what happens is because they're hard to manage, especially if you're involved with a lot of people like we are. Typically, that's why people, have, uh, operators have got strong in, in geographic areas because they can run that area. Mm-hmm. So, it's, so it's, an, it's a neat business. Right. And the other thing about it is really neat is you can't wash a car online. That's so, right. Yeah. So, and and in this, on this day and age, that's an issue. Yeah, yeah. It is, you know. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose that the, that the biggest shift would be people coming to their house and washing it. It, and and even that's probably not denting your business by by any people want convenience that's right you yeah. know i mean you know i mean yeah we call it driveway washing or bucket washing i mean there, yeah, i mean anybody in a, in a nice afternoon can get the hose out and wash your car and, yeah uh, but you know what's not going to look the same as going through a professional car wash the equipment and the, the systems the procedures the chemicals they all add up to to give you that nice looking wash. So you can do it in your driveway, but unless you spend a lot of time, it's probably not going to look That's the right. same. And after, typically, what we find is people will do it the odd time on a Sunday afternoon if they're um, you know they got nothing to do. They'll they'll wash the car, and, you know. <laughs> so, but uh, sometimes you know you drive down the street and you see somebody who's tried to wash their car at home, and you can tell because it's full of streaks. They miss this, they miss that, and whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the difference between going, going to a professional car wash is is you just get a, a better looking product. That's mm-hmm. right. And that's part of the thing we're selling, you know, a better looking product. Yeah. Look good. So two registered trademarks we have. Look good in a clean car and feel good in a clean car. Right. It's like, it's sort of like a lady getting their hair done. I always say, you know, after a woman, my wife comes home, after she gets her hair done, she says, and, and, if, I, and if I forget, she was at the hairdresser, she says, Oh, how do I look today? And this, and getting your car washed is sort of the same kind of thing. It gives you a good feeling. You drive down the street, you're in a clean car, saying, "Oh, this is nice. This, it feels great. My, I feel good. My car is clean. I feel good." That's right. Yeah. So we're in the business of of helping people feel good and to feel good about their vehicles. Yeah. yeah. And if well, we can, that helps. You know, it's not even just the clean car, but you guys do something that is very unmistakable, and that's the smell. Yeah. So so typically, um. Um, car wash uh, chemicals have some fragrances in them just to, you know, spoof them up a little bit and so mm-hmm. whatever, you know. But um, if I open the garage, I can tell really? before I even see yeah. my wife's vehicle yeah. that I know that she's washed it. Well, it's interesting. I've been washing cars for 25 years and I, I love the smell of the car wash when I walk in because mm-hmm. you smell it. Like, and I mean, to me, it's like home because we've been in business a long time, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, it's a neat business in that respect. Um, and one of the funny things about this, there's many funny things about this business and many businesses, but our business, people come in and they say, you're always busy. Every time I come here, you're busy. I say, no, we're not always busy. We're busy because it's a good washing day. That's right. Come here when it's raining. Yeah. Come here when it's cloudy. And so it's, so it's a neat business in that sense. When it's on, it's on. And when it's off because the weather's bad, it's off. It's just one of those things, you know? Mm-hmm. So first location open up 1998. February of 98, yeah. Beautiful. And that was on? Reinders, right by the taxation center. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what happened, I lived in North Caldona and drove by this site, an empty site. And I thought, man, that's a good place for a car wash right off the highway. So my brother and I got together, he was my partner, and we secured the land and went to the bank. And the bank said, there's no way we're going to lend you any money. Not a chance. Fair enough. Forget it. Okay. So, so, so we found a fellow, um, uh, Ted Petkow. He owned Concord Projects. He, we flipped the deal to him. We put in, we put in the offer that we had the right to flip the deal to a developer, Mm -hmm. which was a good move. So we flipped the deal to him. He built the building for us and leased it back to us on a short term lease. And, and, um, so that got us into business. Yeah, so that was the first one. Yeah. So the second one, uh, Sandy Schindelman's father used to stop in at the Rangers location and uh, wash his car. And he said, well, if you want to build one, you know, somewhere else, why don't you go see my son, Sandy? So we went and saw Sandy and put a deal together on, on the Waverly, please. Fantastic. So we got that done a couple of years later. So I went back to Ted Petkow 
and um, said, Ted, uh, uh, we've got this, um, this deal here. Would you like to build it for us? And of course they would. Mm-hmm. But uh, I said, I want something for you. I have short money. I need you to lend me some money, which he did. And, um, and then um, I said, but I want an option to buy the Reinders property back because it was ours originally. So he gave us an option to buy it back, built the Waverly location for us. Beautiful. So after a while, we had enough cash flow that we exercised our option to buy the Reinders property back. How many years was that later? Oh, that would have been, we would have bought that in about 2000. And we opened up Waverly in 2001. So it would have been about 2003 or so, somewhere around there. Okay. By that time, you know, we were in business and, um, you know, the bank was willing to, well, chartered banks, no, not really. We ended up with the business development bank and, and they helped us out. Yep. So, yep. so another interesting story when we were dealing on money for Waverly, we wanted to borrow money for the Waverly location. There was uh, one of the VPs of the business development bank from Vancouver was in town. And the fellow I dealt with then, I think, was Chris Smith. Chris phoned me and said, hey, can I bring my VP by your wash today? It's when we only had reinders. And I said, yeah, sure, bring him by. So he comes by Friday afternoon with his VP, and there must have been 50 cars in the parking lot, you know, waiting to get washed. We got our money. <laughs> you know, it's just... Yep. It's one of those things that works out really good, you know. The mm-hmm. guy walks in, looks around, there's people at the tail, <laughs> there's people everywhere, cars everywhere. Yeah, I guess we can lend you some money. Yeah, that's and fair. So that's what happened, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and then the third one came. Okay, the third one came. So we wanted something um, in the St. James area. And um, we ended up um, on the piece at 1285 St. James beside Costco. Mm-hmm. And here again, by that time, it was a little bit easier getting money because now we had two of them and, and so on. And so proven. So, yeah, it was proven, exactly. So that one, we actually borrowed the money from the Cinnabon Credit Union. And um, we went back and, um, and, you know, they were willing to finance it at that point. Mm-hmm. But another interesting story I could tell. I used to get these chartered banks would come in to see me. And I love the banks. I, I deal with banks all the time. Uh, and they'd come in to see me, and especially in the first few years, you know, they see the cars, they come in and talk to me. And I would just say, look, if you guys saw my balance sheet, you would run. And they never came back. And there you <laughs> go. And I, so I, I've, I've always stuck with um, sort of the alternative financing a little bit, which is uh, Cinewa Credit Union, Business Development Bank, guys like that, you know. And they treated me well, so I have no problem with that. Well, they're a little easier to uh, develop more relationships. They have yeah. more flexible regulations yeah. and rules and... Yeah. yeah, that's what I found too. Yeah, I found a Cinnabon really good, to be honest with you. Cinnabon mm-hmm. Credit Union, really good. And, and, and the Business Development Bank also. Yeah. So you see this, this property, you don't yes. have any car washes under your belt. Yes. Why is it that you thought about a car wash to go on there? And, and what got you to that point? I knew you were going to ask that. Okay, so my history, my background is um, when I was, I went to Grand Park. And um, when I was in high school, and they keep asking you, what do you want to do? You know, like, what are you going to do with your life? I, I don't know. Yeah. But anyways, I worked at McDonald's part time. And then when I finished high school, I joined McDonald's in their management training program. I wasn't that great a student, to be honest with you. And um, I mean, I could probably obviously could have done better if I wanted. But um, I was working full time in grade 12 at McDonald's across the street. Mm-hmm. It was awesome because yeah. money coming in, you know, and, you know, I wasn't getting a lot of sleep, but, uh, you know, whatever. So anyways, I joined McDonald's in their management training program, worked there for a couple of years. And then um, uh, another interesting story, it's funny how life takes you in different directions, you know. Anyways, this, uh, this really nice fellow, Sheldon Bowles was his name. Um, he was running Domo at the time and he went, I I think the story sort of goes that, um, he was complaining to his wife one day about, he wanted to run his Domo's as good as McDonald's. And I believe his wife said, well, why don't you go down to, or or no, if you, I think the story was, if you could run your Domo's as good as McDonald's runs their operation, then you'd have something. And he went down to see who the manager was. Mm-hmm. And the guy's name was Vic Nagel. Anyways, he hired Vic away to run Domo. And then a year or so later, they approached me. I ended up at Domo anyways. So I stayed with Domo. I ran, I ran with Domo. I ended up being vice president of operations and stayed doing it for 15 years. 
And it was great. They were great people. Worked for the Everett family, and uh, yeah, they're all good people. But I wasn't ever going to be an owner. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Second story. When in the springtime, the major oil companies back in, uh, would have been in the 70s and early 80s, they used to give away free car washes. So it used to affect the gasoline sales at, at Domo because the free car washes would drag people away. So Sheldon Bowles, he was one of the owners of Domo, and mostly Sheldon, started looking at the car wash business with me, but it was sort of Sheldon's idea in the beginning. So I had looked at the, at the car wash business with this Sheldon um, you know, for a while. We'd looked at it. So that was sort of my, um, my um, uh, introduction, I guess you would say, to the car wash business. So eventually, um, for whatever reason, uh, my brother had, my, I, my brother Barry was my partner. He had moved back to Winnipeg and he said, you've never done anything about that car wash thing. And I said, no. And so we got together and um, because I lived in North Caldona and the Rangers property, I thought was a great spot. So, mm -hmm. so that's how I ended up in the car wash business. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the you know what, here's the thing that, I mean, all entrepreneurs take a chance when they go into business but a big part of it was my wife she allowed me to mortgage everything we owned in that first car wash so when you go to somebody and say hey honey you know what we our house is you know you're like 40 something years old you worked all your life your home's paid for you know your cottage is paid for you don't have much debt and you want to you want to borrow against that so you become very serious about what you're trying to accomplish, yeah. yeah because you don't want to, you don't have a second chance, basically. So, so yeah. So we didn't make a ton of money the first few years. The biggest reason we weren't charging enough it was too cheap, and the price was low. And I think it should have been higher if I look back now. But I was very determined to to build the volume. Mm -hmm. So we kept the price low. We did a lot of volume. Didn't make a lot of money though. But we made enough to stay in business. And eventually, you know, as, 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 eventually as time goes on, you pay the debt down a little bit and your, uh, you know, your costs, your carrying costs and your financing costs go down a little bit. So it, mm -hmm. it improves your profitability a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So we made a little bit of money. And you know what? I've got a ton of people with me, been with me 20 plus years, a, a ton of them. A lot of the management uh, has been around for That's incredible. 18 to 23. Oh, yeah. I got some guys that, you know, some really good people who've mm -hmm. been with me a long time. I've got, uh, you know, um, Kyle Thompson's one of my manager at Waverly. He's been around a long time. His brother, Ryan Thompson, runs my Rangers location. Stefan Hassanoff is a manager at, um, at St. James. And I've got a bunch of other people, uh, you know, who've just been around for a ton of time. Yeah. That's so what's great. the secret? You know, I pay them well. Yeah. yeah. Of course, right? That uh, treating treating people well and and paying them, that's so it's really that's a good recipe. So it's really interesting when these kids were younger when they first started working for me. It was really neat because they worked for you for a while and they're like you know seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, whatever they are, and they're buying cars. You see the cars in the parking lot, and you see the cars in the parking lot get a little nicer as time goes on, you know. And um, and then they're buying homes as they get older, mm -hmm. and then they're buying you know second home sort of thing. And then they're having children, they're having families, you know. So a lot of them are, you know, late 30s, early 40s now. And they, they've got kids and they've spent, you know, 20 something years with you. And they've really, they really contributed to your success because they're the ones that do it every day for you. Mm -hmm. So it's, I call it, I, I call it like a marriage. Okay. You know, you know, they do well, I do well. Yep. And as long as we get along, it keeps going. At any time it doesn't get along, they have a choice. They can leave or I can, you know, um, choose for them to leave if it's not working. Yeah. So, so I think, uh, you know, in some ways, um, do we make a little bit less money because we um, try to look after our people really well? In the end, I don't think so. I think that it gives me some freedom. And, and if you treat your people well, there's a better chance they'll treat, they'll treat your customers well. 100%. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. It gives you a little more peace as well. 100%. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I've, uh, I've definitely, uh, and I've, I've joked to my employees about, uh, being selfish that oh, I yeah. want, that I want them to do better because ultimately if they do better in life, they're happier with their life. They come to work, they're happier and they'll do better for me. Right. So, but, but it's true. Yeah. Well, when I'm away and I, I try and spend some time away and, um, 
I don't want them thinking, you know, oh, that guy is down wherever he is in Arizona somewhere. I want them thinking, um, oh, that's great. He's given us an opportunity. I'm happy to run the business for him. And he trusts me. Yeah. That's, you know, so, yeah, yeah so, absolutely. Yeah. So, so where do you think that your uh, entrepreneurial drive and, 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 how did I get started? Why? Courage okay. came from. I can, tell so, you, I can tell you in a heartbeat. I grew up in a house in River Heights, four children, mom didn't work. Dad was an air traffic controller. Wasn't a lot of money in those days. Yeah. So when I was 10 years old, I bought my first lawnmower. And I don't mean mom and dad gave me a lawnmower. I went and bought a lawnmower to cut grass. I had a I grass like cutting it. business. I like it. When I was 12, I bought a snowblower. And I had a snow clearing business in River Heights. Okay. And through her heights. In between doing that, I delivered papers. Mm -hmm. On top of that, when I wasn't delivering papers and cutting grass and clearing snow, I sold greeting cards door to door. Oh, fantastic. And selling the greeting cards door to door really, um, you know, you had to talk to people. You had to learn to talk to people. Yeah. So I've done everything I could since I was young on to, to um, have money and, and have independence. And I'll tell you, this is a true story. When I was about uh, 14 or 15 years old, somewhere around, I can't remember the exact days, I went to my dad, and I love my dad and mom dearly. I went to my dad and I said, uh, Dad, I want to be really successful in life. I said, um, uh, what, do, what do I do? What do you think I should do? And he says, Dave, look around this house. What do you see? And he said, I, I said, I don't see much. He said, I'm sorry, I can't help you. True story. And he wasn't being uh -huh. mean yep. about it. He was yep. being honest about it. He said, look around this house. What do you see? Well, we lived in a three bedroom house, 960 square feet with six people, one washroom. And he said, boy, was mad. <laughs> if, if you want to learn how to be successful, I, I can't help you go in. You got to go learn it on your own. Yeah. And that's what I did. And so I made a conscious decision. This, another interesting thing. So I was in high school. And, I'm, and I wanted to, you know, make money and I wanted to do well. And I had this thought. This thought was that people who own businesses will pay a lot of money to people who can run their businesses for them. That's why I got into management. Mm. And I also knew it was like an apprenticeship. I'll spend 15 years or 20 years, whatever it's going to take to learn myself and then eventually use it for yourself. You know, and, and, and it worked out really good for me. So you went through the McDonald's uh, man management training? For a couple of years, yeah. yeah. And what was your experience like going through that? So McDonald's was really great because they, they taught systems and procedures. Oh. So I learned <laughs> systems and procedures. And um, so when I went to Domo, and um, uh, I would say that probably they were a little bit lacking in systems and procedures in the first place. Mm-hmm. So along with this other fellow I worked with, uh, Sheldon Bowles, um, you know, we really went to work procedurizing the gas business, you know, right. yep. the, the, serving the customer, um, how you serve a customer, what do you say to a customer, how do you do this, how do you do that? So McDonald's has a very interesting program at the time, and I learned it at McDonald's. <clears throat> We audited our people at McDonald's. They had an actual audit sheet called a check sheet, audit sheet, whatever you want to call it, where you actually watch the person and then you see if they're following the proper steps. Okay. So when I went to Domo, we wrote a bunch of procedures and we made up audit forms. So we go as a supervisor, we park across the street and watch our attendant our customer service person to see if they're following the proper procedures. Mm -hmm. Then we go in and mark them. Are they wearing a uniform? Are they doing this? Are they smiling? So that, that, that attention to detail and systemizing the procedures and checking those procedures. See, people respect what you inspect, not what you expect. So when you inspect something, people pay attention to it. You can, ex it's like your kids. I mean, you can expect all you want for your children, but if you don't, you can tell them to be home at 11 o'clock every day, but if they don't come home, you don't do anything about it. They're not going to pay attention to it, right? So then, so then when we, when my brother and I, Barry, started the car wash thing, the first thing we, we did was systemize everything. Okay, this is how you vacuum the car. This is how you wipe the car down. 
this is how you approach the customer. And then we made up audit sheets. And we still, to this day, audit our people on a regular basis. And I, I would say anybody who's, who wants to do really well in a business, especially who wants to have more than one location, you have to, everything has to be in writing. In the same business, if you don't have it in writing, you don't have it. That's right. And my God, I've learned that over the years so many times. Yeah. <laughs> so, and if somebody will say something and they'll say, well, well, where's it written? You're right. It's not written. Yeah. doesn't matter what you think. It's not written. So yeah. I'll, I'll reiterate what yes. you said there. People respect what you inspect, not what you expect. Correct. I love that. Yeah. And that's not mine. I got it from somewhere yeah. along the line. But, but I mean, it's there to be used. Right. And I use it all the time. Yeah. You know? Well, I was, I was in your car wash on Waverly and I was looking at, so it was a really busy day mm -hmm. and I was, I was watching all the people after I had gone through right. and watching all your people, uh, work in my business. My biggest headache is people is, is depending on, uh, subcontractors on other people that I have to not only rely on that they'll show up, that they'll do the job but that they um, respect their, their work and they respect my brand enough to come to work and, and they want to be on our sites and they want to do stuff. So, you know, I, I immediately felt for, before I knew you, I felt for you in thinking, how, does, how do they operate this many people like this? Okay, so we have about... 80 to 90 people, 75 to 90 people per location, give or take. Yeah. Yeah. 45 of them are probably full time, you know, half of them full time, half part time. Um, so we go through the training process with them. We do the audits before they go on the floor. We have a location manager, general manager. We have an assistant manager. We have a detail manager who runs the detail departments. Mm -hmm. We have, um, cash and sales team leader we call them. that person runs the the cash and sales area so we put a huge amount of effort into management into having the right people in the right places and that mm -hmm. um running the people managing the people is is one of the most difficult things of any business and but it can set you apart from other businesses if you can manage it if you can do it Mm -hmm. And it's a nightmare. I wouldn't wish it upon anybody, to be honest with you. But we figured out, you know, how to do it for the most part. Um, it's hard sometimes. And, I, and, you know, I've had people say to me many times, and I know some people in the manufacturing business and, you know, different people. And I was, I spent some time in the manufacturing business. You know, people often look at your business and, and you think that, um, well, that guy's business is easy. Nobody's business is easy. Every business has its issues. Mm -hmm. I was in the manufacturing business, you know, and nonconformance and rework were a huge nightmare. Mm -hmm. And then, then sometimes people didn't pay their bills. You, you build all this product, people don't pay their bills. At least ours is mostly cash and visa. So the, at least we get our money, you know. That's right. But managing the people, yeah, that's a huge issue. So we have, um, we have a general manager, uh, like I said, assistant managers, uh, department managers, um, supervisors that run the shifts, team leaders who help on the floor. Tremendous amount of effort put into to management. And it's really funny. I've had people come in sometimes and, you know, they'll say, um, you know, you didn't vacuum my trunk properly. I said, no problem. We'll, we'll try and get it fixed up for you. And then some, a customer will say, don't you train your people? And it's, it's interesting because we, that's all we do is train people. Mm -hmm. Like I'll tell you another interesting thing we do. We have a monthly general meeting. We call it a safety and quality meeting. We get all the staff in have pizza, give out some awards and prizes. And we talk about safety issues, quality issues, and, and any other issues that, um, that come up. And then we do some training in that. We do it once a month. We've been doing it for 25 years. And, and putting the effort in, into training is probably the, the single, one of the single most important things you can do, a training to follow up. And then the other thing is treating people with respect and, um, and, and giving them an opportunity to do better. Uh, if you can make opportunities for them to to move up and do better, talk to many business people in their you know fifties and sixties, and by that time they've had it running the people, the managing the people. Yeah. That's the hardest thing by far. 
You train somebody, you do all this work, and somebody gives them a buck and a half an hour more than you, and mm -hmm. they're gone. <laughs> my, ki my kids uh, are often in the truck with me. Yes. And they have their guy. And I, I realized that their guy, so my daughter, who's four, and my, my yeah. son, Emmett, who's nine, yeah. um, whenever they see their person, yeah. they'll say, hey, there's my guy, or there's your guy, or whatever. And I, and I kind of caught it. Yeah. And it's because at one point or another, they've waved to them. Oh, okay. Probably once or twice. Yeah. yeah. And then from then on, yeah. it was forever. Yeah. Yeah. Imprinted. Interesting. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Really cool. Yeah. Really cool. Um, so was there ever when, when you were, whether it was before or, you know, the first, second, third location, what was the moment where you realized that you had something that was working? I don't think I still believe I have something that's working, to be honest with you. Somebody asked that asked me a while ago, you know, uh, you've been open 20 something years. Can't you relax now? I said, no, no, you can't because you know, you're in business, you know, you're only as good as your last day. That's it. And somebody can steal your customer in a heartbeat. So, you know, um, like I, I, I guess some days I, you know, <laughs> I leave the wash and I see all the cars there and think, oh, OK, this is pretty good. I guess you are successful. And other days, it's like, geez, I, I don't know. And, you know, so I guess sometimes, um, uh, yeah, when did I, I don't know if I've ever actually realized that, that this thing actually works, you know, but. Um, well, you've made we it. Watched, over, what's that? Yeah, you've made it over a lot of the. Yeah. The time, right? Yeah. Over the, the five year, yeah. the 10 year. And, had, and those. Yeah. That, that yeah. Um, exponentially drops within companies that fail, right? Yeah. The, I mean, the, the track record for new startups is not good. As people say all the time, it's yeah. not good, you know. Um, well, we had some rough times. I mean, it's not always not been great. Um, 2008 was really rough. I just built the St. James location. And. It was like four plus million dollars to, to build that thing and buy the land. And that's cheap compared to what it would cost nowadays. Probably cost 11 or 12. But, um, and um, 2008 is exactly when the financial meltdown happened. Gas prices went to a buck 50 a liter. People stopped spending money. And we had the worst weather we've had in years. So, I mean, that whole... 2008 2009 uh, i mean i remember after we opened up st james i remember you know in the laying there just ready to go to bed with my wife you know laying down and she'd say um you know how'd st james do today i say um <laughs> i'd say not very good and she was hilarious she would say uh, and it's a true story she'd say but you can fix it right I said, yes dear i can fix it <laughs> you know what else are you gonna say eh? and then she and this is a true story and she said to me you know what? Uh, she said, I, you know, I love you, but if you screw this up, I'll never forgive you. I said, yes, dear, I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyways, and then the weather started getting better. The economy picked up a little bit. And sometimes it takes a time when it takes time when you open up a business. You, you have to you're going to steal that business from somebody else. OK, or you got to take it from somewhere. It's going to come from somewhere. So I've learned it takes a little time sometimes. You know what I mean? It's not going to be instant. You know, it takes a little time. So, um, what did yeah. the growth look like, uh, after the first, when you opened up your first one, what did it, well, Rangers was really good because there was no full service car washes on the whole East side of the city. And we opened up a 995, which was probably a mistake from a profitability point of view, because we never made any money, <laughs> but we washed a lot of cars and we had cash flow. You know, we had cash. Yeah, flow. It's got a lot got, of practice. Yeah. And when you got cash flow, at least, you know, okay, well, it's come coming in, some coming out, you know, one of those things. I say that building luxury homes. I have a lot of practice making yeah. money. One one day I'll actually do it. Yeah, it's real. I mean, so another thing I learned about business too, and learned this from other people, and how hopefully I didn't have to learn it myself. You no, know, you know, I talk to business people sometimes, and a lot of them in their sixties and that will try and cut back on their business. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. You can't cut back on a business. You either run it or you sell it. Because if you're not prepared to run it, you better sell it because you can't cut back. It's just not going to happen. Mm. You've got to be involved in it 100%. Or you got to have some really, really friggin' good people. And, that, and, and reality is that you got to run your business, you know. So I'm, so I'm still involved. I'm almost 70. I'm still involved. I mean, not as much. And I, I mean, I don't wash cars. 
But I did for years when yeah. it was for years, I went and helped all it. And I still this day, if I show up at a wash and there's a big lineup and they need help, I'll dig in, help vacuum cars, wipe cars, now whatever it takes. Because the cars are only here right now. That's right. Tomorrow it may be raining. They're not here. So don't take it for granted. Try and wash them when you can. You it's know? very insightful. So 2008 yes. hit pretty hard. Yes. How did COVID treat you? It was tough. So, so after 2008, 2009, we started going better. Volume started picking up and, you know, gas prices went down. Economy came along. We got a little more established. Yeah. We were smoking right up until March of 19. Uh, that was COVID, 19 or 20. It was 20. Anyways, right up till time COVID hit, we were smoking. And after that, everything just changed in a heartbeat. People didn't want to drive. They were working from home. Mm -hmm. They didn't want people in their cars. Um, and they were afraid to do anything. Right. And uh, whatever. So it was tough. I mean, and, you know, but this year and then, oh, another interesting story. Um, so in, in 21, so it was March of 20, it was 20 that COVID hit. Anyway, so in, in 21, in October, was, things started picking up a little bit in, in December. And I thought, okay, we're back here. Things are great. And then in January of 22, the uh, other variant hit, the Omicron variant hit in January. And we had the coldest winter we've had in years and the most snow. So we washed nothing January, February, March, you know. Uh, so that was a tough winter. But, you know, we've been in business a long time. I'm not, you know, starting out. And yep. It was okay. And then we came back. Um, so it was a little bit, 20 was tough, 21, 22 was a little bit tough. Anyways, um, last winter, 23, it was a warm winter. We didn't have a lot of snow. It was an awesome year. We washed a ton of cars this year. It was great. I mean... So I'm sort of like a farmer a little bit, except <laughs> I play in the weather hundred percent. But for me, one of the, most of the time we're pretty lucky in the sense we lose a month or two. We don't lose a year. Usually farmers, I feel for them because that's tough. They have, a, they lose a year. They have a bad crops. So they're done for the next year. So it's like, right. try again next year. Yeah. You know, for us, we lose a month or, or two anyways. Um, but, um, anyway, so one, uh, uh, interesting thing. So St. James, when we bought in 2008, we'll open up the St. James location. If that would have been my first store in 2008, I don't know, might not have made it. So sometimes luck is on your side a little bit too. You got a little bit of luck, you know, mm. the biggest thing I think is, uh, in business too, is, you know, business owners, um, sometimes they start making money and next thing you know, they live in, you know, multi-million dollar homes and they drive um, Ferraris and all this kind of stuff. And the car washes, we don't make that kind of money. So I try to keep my, I try to keep our overhead reasonable and, and live reasonable and so on and so forth. You know, do I, have I done okay? Yeah, I got a home in Phoenix and, you know, a cottage and so on and so forth, you know. So, you know, yeah, it's been worthwhile. Um, personally, I, I, I like business. I just like business. Yeah, like it that's a good time game. I, from the time I was 10 years old, I like business. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway. I remember our paper routes, those started really early. And there was, we had five, five boys. Yeah. And all of us yeah. had paper routes. Well, it's money. And it's before school yeah. and just, it's pitch black out. Yeah. I'm scared shitless walking down the alleys. Yeah. I remember that many yeah. times. Well, in my day, we used to deliver papers after school. It was an after school yeah. thing. That's yeah. what you used to do it after school. And the thing about delivering papers back those days, you had to go collect the money from the customer. <laughs> That's right. If the customer didn't pay you. <laughs> it was on you. Yeah. On a 12-year-old kid. It's the most ridiculous <laughs> thing in the world that these, these that the free press or the Tribune got away with that. So I had somebody I was just talking to the other day, had a paper, same age as me. And he said, uh, you know, he never did that. He said that, that if the customers didn't pay, he said he didn't pay the free press. And I said, you got away with that? And he said, yeah. I never thought about that. Yeah. You know, I never, it never even dawned on me that I might, you know, not to pay the free press. I know. No yeah. kidding. Yeah. I do remember that chasing yeah. grown men for, oh, for weeks. And you know, you'd have these, we had these little, old. we had these little tickets. And when they paid, you gave them the ticket and you'd get a whole row of tickets where this guy hadn't paid for three or four weeks. They're never home. Can't get them. Don't have any money today yeah. on a 12 year old kid. <laughs> I remember that too. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, take me through. Um, so there, there's branding, there's marketing, there's advertising. There's also sales mixed in there and then process and fulfillment and procedures and systems. Okay. So what's your view about, um, each of those? Okay. And, so I'll and, give you a couple of, yeah, I can, I can. Yeah. 
give you a couple little stories on that. So the name Shammy. So my brother and I are partners in this business, and we're trying to come up with names. And we thought about calling it the TLC Car Wash, Brothers Car Wash. And we're backing out of the driveway one time. My, my wife says, why don't you just call it the Shammy? I said, genius. That's awesome. Genius. So I went to my brother, and um, it's a true story. My brother's uh, wife has uh, since passed away, it's unfortunate, but she was a school teacher, and she said, ah, nobody's not going to spell it. And I said, I don't, it doesn't matter. We're going to make it a trade name. We're going to make it a trade name so people, a brand. We're going to make it into a brand, mm -hmm. you know, so it doesn't matter. So, I mean, you, you can pick any name you want, I think. It doesn't really matter. A name isn't going to make or break you. It's just you gotta, you know, you gotta, you gotta build that name into a brand. One thing you shouldn't do is you shouldn't, in my opinion, call your business like um, WSG Car Wash and stuff like that. Because if you ever look it up online, and I read this in a marketing book one time, there's literally millions of companies in the world that are called, um, you know, LSU or this or that or whatever. And I mean, only a few of them ever stick. MTS, fine. You're the Manitoba Telephone System. We know you're MTS. Mm -hmm. So, so I didn't want to. So I wanted to have a name and a brand. Um, we started off doing radio advertising in the beginning. Don't really. I mean, I guess it helped. It's hard to say, but it's only so much money. It's hard to track. Is really, uh, yeah, all advertising is hard to track. But yeah. does it work for you? I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. But um, so one of the things about 15 years ago. Uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Robert Zyluk, and he's Innovative Promotions um, is his company. And we had met him through somebody else, and he came to my son and I, Ryan, and he said, you guys really need some help with your marketing and your advertising and stuff. And I said, yeah, you're right, we do. And um, so we have Robert uh, Innovative Promotions. He works with us, does a great job. He helps with our creative and our advertising and marketing. We sit down with him once a week and go through our plan. So we have a yearly promotions calendar. Like we just did a thing with the Kidney Foundation in July. We sell kidney beans to raise money. We raised 14000 for the Kidney Foundation, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. And then we in December, December, we sell Christmas trees for the cheer board and stuff like that and whatever. It's a few different things in between. So Robert helps me with our merchandise, our marketing. Um, the pricing structure, I mean, that's something we sit down all the time and hash it out. Uh, you know, what's, what can we charge? What's the costing us? Minimum wage keeps going up really difficult and getting people is really hard. So we've had to really pump the price up the last four or five years and I don't have any choice. I'd rather if the price was lower. Absolutely. Price is lower. People are going to wash the car more often. Higher the price is less people are going to wash, you know, but I don't have any choice. Labor, when we opened up, uh, minimum wage was $5.40, and this fall it's going to be fifteen thirty. Mm -hmm. So it's just a fact of life. And, and, and even getting people at fifteen thirty is pretty difficult. Most of the people are probably making more like $18, $19 an hour. You know, you have to. I mean, if you don't pay people, it, uh, you know, you're not going to get people. So, so Robert helps us with uh, marketing and merchandising. Um, I have a full-time maintenance guy. We never used to, but about uh, 2009 or 10, we hired uh, a, a, a nice gentleman, well, a young guy from, um, he worked for Robinson Pump doing um, car wash work and that. His name is Derek, Derek Sim. And uh, he, um, he, he's a full-time maintenance guy. So I have a guy that works full-time just maintaining equipment and yep. keeping things going because... The car wash is full of it's full of pumps and motors and things that turn and and requires a huge amount of maintenance to keep it all going. Well, if something on your line goes down and stops everything. Yeah, everything that's stops. a problem. When something goes down with a wash, um, and we have to actually shut down, I call it a plane crash. I'd say. Yeah. So if one piece of equipment fails, that's okay. We'll tie it back. We'll do this. We'll do that. It's okay. But I, I, and that's how I try and describe it to my team. When the actual thing shuts down, that to me is like, if you like, it's not a plane crash, but it's like a plane crash. It's disaster. You're not in business. And Stops all the everything. salaries are still there. You still got to pay people, but there's, there's no money coming in the door. And the customer's disappointed. Customer comes by. So since we've got Derek full time, um, 
oh, we have less plane, plane crashes. So we work very hard not to have plane crashes. Right. <laughs> but yeah. It does happen. Yeah. yeah. It happens. We try and get, and sometimes it's the simplest little electronic thing. You think it's, uh, you know, yeah, sometimes um, it'll be something as um, simple as uh, a, an oil tank is low. So the system shuts itself down and somebody didn't read it right and didn't realize it's a low oil tank or something like that or a pressure switch or something. But we work very hard to try and keep that line going. So when those customers come in, they can get their car washed. Yeah. So what was the hardest part about starting your business versus what the hardest part now is in managing? When you get older, you're, you you come a little, you, you know, I'm almost 70, like I said. So now all of a sudden you look at your life and you're probably not as willing to take the risks, risks now that you would take when you're younger. Right. You know, I don't know if there was anything really, really hard in the beginning. Um, mortgaging our homes and our livelihood was probably a difficult thing in the sense that um, you know you're committed 100%. There's, no, there's nothing wishy-washy about this. You've just borrowed a whole ton of money, signed on the dotted line, the banks have signed. And, and sometimes people complain to me, oh, the banks don't want to lend me money. They want this. Well, banks are not in the risk business. Banks are in the lending money business. You're in the risk business. So I don't have, I don't have any animosity towards banks. The banks are there to lend you money and you're there to take the risk. It's just as simple as that, you know. Right. Um I think the hardest thing now is um just um taking a brand and and just keeping it fresh, making sure it's going good. You're doing new things, you're keeping your buildings up. I see a lot of people in the car wash business um in uh, different parts of the North America who will take a business and and um, just milk it for money, just not spend money on it, take money out of it. Not reinvest. So, yeah, we work really hard to keep things up. And, you know, we we put new equipment into, um, after we opened up St. James, we, we invested in some different equipment there and it did a better job. So three years later, two and a half years later, we, we changed the equipment packages in uh, St. James, and oh no, I'm sorry, Waverly and Reinders. So Waverly had only been open about um, six, seven, eight years when we ripped out the equipment and uh, basically used car wash equipment is worth nothing. <laughs> so we realized there was a, you know, so we upgraded the equipment after a very short time, which was a smart move. We've changed the lighting packages in the washes several times. We've changed the conveyors a few times. You got you, uh, you to keep this stuff up. Otherwise, it starts looking really poor. It's like going into a Tim Hortons. And they're, they're, Tim Hortons is good. They renovate their stores quite often. You have to do it. The car wash is a little more difficult in the sense that um, the huge buildings and renovating them is, is tough. But we try to keep them up. We try to repair everything when it needs repairing, paint things when it needs painting, you know, pave the parking lot when it needs, you know, paving. And keep it so that when people come in, the place looks good. Right. You know, you know, and it's easy to let stuff get run down, but it it can look really poor really quickly. Yeah. So so we try. So go back to your original question about um, what is harder now than back then. I, I would say just keeping everything going and, and being innovative and, and so on and so forth. You know, um, I just want to mention one thing, too. Um, we have a really good chemical supplier, Robinson Pump. And, um, and there's this uh, uh, younger guy than me, but Andy, he, um, he's worked for Robinson for years, and uh, he does a really good job of delivering the chemical onto the car. And Andy's job, so, so I've tried to select, and it goes sort of back to my uh, maintenance guy, Derek. I, I, I'm jumping around a bit, but I've tried to um, select really good people, you know, and have the right people in the right positions. Mm -hmm. So Robinson does a really good job with their guy, Andy, in, in providing the chemical um, for us. And the other thing that when I first got going, I was very fortunate. I got a good accountant and a, and a, and a good lawyer who were, they're smart guys, not cheap. Nobody is though, if they're good. And um, so uh, that was good. You had some help and, and your lawyer is not in charge of your business and you got to be careful. And either is your accountant. Nope. No. <laughs> but, so it's very interesting. I remember when I built St. James 
in the meantime, I had, I, I had bought my brother out and I was paying him off over seven years. He had some medical issues. So I, we did a deal in 2005, I think it was around there. It took me seven years to pay him off, but I'm happy for him. Anyways, um, uh, we did a deal and my lawyer at the time said, ah, I think you should wait till, um, till, you know, you pay your brother off before you, in, in, you know, go spend another $4 million, you know? I said, yeah, but the problem is, if I build it now, by the time I get him paid, uh, get him paid off, you know, this will already be in place, right? So I didn't listen to my lawyer, didn't listen to my wife, and probably the best thing we ever did, just move ahead. You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. And, and same with my, I remember my accountant, I love my accountant, he's a great guy. He's actually retired since then, but um, um, Dean Magnus, anyways, um, uh, Dean said to me one day, oh, we hired a full-time maintenance guy. <laughs> he said, that's going to cost you a lot of money. <laughs> and I started laughing, yeah, it is, but it's going to keep the equipment running better. You know, so, so yeah. I mean, so you got to look at it's all the seeing the, the forest from the trees. Yeah. You got to look at all the facets of the things and, yep. and you know. And, and who uh, better than somebody who knows the, the yeah. business inside and out. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, business, and one thing I learned about business a long time ago, so business is doing a thousand things better than the competition, not doing one thing a thousand percent better than a competition. It's doing every single little thing you can. And like I, a good example, I, I just drove by my St. James store earlier here and they had a sign up. And I, I'm going to go talk to Stefan about this. He had a sign up on the bill on the reader board said, said, we, we wash most sports cars. I'm thinking, that's a ridiculous sign. We wash all sports cars. Why would you put most sports cars? Because anything we can't wash on the line, we'll wash it by hand. I don't care. You got a sports car you want to wash? We'll wash it. You know, and, this, and that's part of, it's part of the attitude thing, right? It's 100%. You no, know, do it this way. Um, and then looking, another thing that, that I sort of learned over the years, and it comes, comes back to this fellow who owned part of Domo Sheldon Bowles, we used to talk about sweating the smallies, which is sweating the small little things too. You know what I mean? Pay attention to the little things because in the end, they all add up a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and so you got to keep a handle on what's going on because your business is very interesting with business. If you're not intimately involved in it and, and keep sort of a handle on what's going on, it can drift off a little bit because somebody gets an idea, well, maybe we should do this and maybe we should do that. And all of a sudden, it starts to drift away from the original plan, you know, yeah, like, I mean, it's funny, you know, sometimes we hire some young person and, um, you know, and we teach them how to vacuum a car and then we come back a while later and they're vacuuming the car a different way. And it's like, well, what are you doing? Why are you vacuuming the car like that? Oh, I, I, I think it would be better if we vacuum the car like this. I said, no, you don't understand. <laughs> this is the way we vacuum a car. This is the way we fly a plane. This is the way we vacuum a car. And I, I go back to the airline industry all the time. The check sheets. When those pilots... And I love watching those Mayday shows because, you know, the pilot has got a check sheet and he, they go through it. Mm -hmm. And there was one, and you know, and when a pilot, when the pilots don't go through the check sheets, sometimes that's when they have problems. Right. Those problems can be a big problem. Yeah. A little problem becomes a big problem, you know. Yeah. So, so we're very systemized. I, I, I can't even express enough how important it is. For businesses who, who want to expand, especially, or don't want to be there themselves every second, procedures and systems. And you look at what, what do people buy when they buy a franchise, whether it's um, a Horton's franchise, a McDonald's franchise, a Burger King franchise, they're buying a system. That's what they're buying. You know, um, the show, uh, the McDonald's show, um, the founder with Ray Kroc, have you ever watched it? I have. I love it. Fantastic. Yeah. The guy's a maniac. He goes out in the golf course and he's yelling at these golfers. Why, what was it? Why is there three pickles on here, not two pickles? Because this is the way it's supposed to be. You put two pickles on a burger, not three. You know, <laughs> so I think that's, you know, it's like, I'll tell you another good um, example is, um, and I don't know the people there. I don't have any affiliation with them. Jerry's Concrete. So Jerry's Concrete, the guy is very systemized. One guy comes and lays it out. One guy comes and forms it. One guy does this. One guy comes and pours it. And that's what they do. And, and it's very interesting. It's like building homes yourself. And one guy does this. I always thought building a house would be really difficult, but it's not. And I've never built homes, but I mean, it's when you break it down in each segment, it's not that bad if each person does their job correctly. That's the hard part. Yep. I know. I understand that 
But you're right. That's where things fall apart. Yeah. As if somebody yeah. skimps or somebody yeah. or one, one, one part of the sequence right. falls out of place, it can domino affect you. Correct. I know. And it doesn't get better as time goes on. That's right. No, <laughs> no, that's no, right. No, yeah. hundred no, no, percent. They snowball no matter what it is. That's yeah. right. Um, are you from Winnipeg? Yes. Yeah. Born and raised. Born and raised. Grew up on Lindsay and River Heights, just over here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So have you ever thought about the pros and cons of, of operating a business in Winnipeg? Do you think it'd be different somewhere else? People often say, and I don't know how true it is, that there's two places in North America to test market products. One of them is Winnipeg in Canada. The other one is Chicago in the U.S. Winnipeg is an interesting market in the sense that um, when I look at Manitoba, I mean, if you look at the, Man the GDP of Manitoba and the population compared to the GDP of Saskatchewan, Alberta, anywhere else, we're, we're basically a bit of a have-not province. And I love living here. we got beautiful lakes, and it's a nice place to live, and the people are really nice, you know. Yeah. But, but my point is that I think that Winnipegers are pretty careful with their money and what they do and, and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of Winnipeg businesses that have expanded. And I mean, we haven't, but who have expanded and done really well. Princess Auto, the Tolman family, I think it is. Unbelievable operation all across Canada. You know, and they started right on Princess Street in downtown Winnipeg. That's why it's called Princess Auto. You know, um, so there's a lot of Winnipeg businesses that have, have done really well. Um, I've also had friends of mine, people I know that have tried to expand and it's been a disaster because you're not there to watch it every day. You know, it's a different thing altogether. Yeah. But I like doing business in Winnipeg. I like the city. It's a nice city. I like the people. The people are friendly and, you know, it's, it's a good city to do business in. I have no complaints about it. It's, you know, it's affordable to buy homes. You know, we have a... We have a really um, a nice guy working for us. Um, a couple of actually a couple of guys from Brazil, and our assistant manager from Waverly. His name is Paulo. And I asked Paulo, you know, why'd you come to Winnipeg from Brazil? And he said because it's affordable. So they, they did a lot of research on home prices and so on and so forth, and they moved to Winnipeg because they they could afford to buy a home here. Whereas a lot of places you can't. You know, anywhere in the lower mainland of Vancouver, Victoria, it's, you know, I just, I was talking to somebody the other day who uh, just bought a house in Victoria a while ago and um, they lease out the whole basement suite. And that's very common uh, in the lower mainland in Victoria because you can't afford the whole one year. So you're in 3000 right. a month for payments. So what do you do? You lease out the basement for $1,000 and hopefully you can afford the house. Yeah. So what you can buy in Winnipeg, I mean, it's more expensive now than it used to be, but no, I think Winnipeg is, I don't really have any comments about doing business in Winnipeg or other places because I haven't really done business in other places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. So uh, here's part of the show that I like to call the Winnipeg shout out. Okay. You were actually my very first shout out because I had gone to the chamois that day when the idea came for the show. Okay. And it was the, the go-to. So you kind of, you guys kind of started it. Uh, and really it's just, uh, giving some love to anyone you think is doing well in Winnipeg, uh, person, company, uh, locations, anything while you think about that, I'm going to start. Uh, I just had a, a new baby. So I've got Congratulations. three. Congratulations. That's awesome. So 10 day old, 10 wow. days old, yeah. uh, local company, but it's now quite large, but skip the dishes. Uh, it's made things a lot easier. Yes. Let me just They're say sure. to just... make sure that last minute dinners are yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, the drivers are, are great and yeah. you can track them. It's convenient. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, and so for that reason, they get my winning shout out. I think that's great. I think that's a really good, um, that's a really good, um, yeah, good shout out because, uh, yeah. And they've had a lot of uh, people copy them now too. They have. Man. Yes. And that's amazing. That when, uh, Skip the Dishes started right here. And it's, uh, they're all over, all over the world now, aren't they? They're all over North America anyways. They've expanded. Yeah, it's incredible. And it's incredible. They started right here. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you know, I spent some time in Arizona and Phoenix. And uh, and uh, because of the Jets moving there, you know, and whatever, or the, t the team that was the Jets or whatever. Mm -hmm. A lot of people know where Winnipeg is now. They never used to. But, but <laughs> yeah. But they do now. So I'll say to somebody, oh, from Winnipeg, and they say, oh, yeah, I know where that is. And then, you know, but yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm, you know, so back to, back to my shout out. That's what you're saying? 
That's right. Well, I would give a shout out to, to, to Peter Janakis at the Pony Corral because I like going there for lunch. And he's a Winnipeg boy and he's yeah. done really well. And um, I go to um, the Grant Park location and um, I go or I go to Nairn Avenue and it's quiet. He runs a good, the people are all nice. Mm -hmm. So I, there's, there's my shout out. Peter, you do a great job. I like it. I just met him the other day for Did the you? first time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I had lunch. There. And he lives in my neighborhood. Oh, there you go. <laughs> okay. There you had you lunch go. with him? Yeah. Uh, no, no, oh. no. I was having lunch with one of his friends. Oh, okay. Yeah, so okay. Came up and I okay. Finally met him there. Okay. Um, what do you think? And, and, and do you give much thought to, um, kind of balance in your life? You know, you're looking at full days. It's taking, you know, a lot of your time, your energy, but have you given much thought to say, you know, time, money, family, faith, all those things in your life? Yeah. Okay. Let's be honest about this. I don't work that hard. Okay. I work, but I don't work like I used to. I'm still involved in the business, you know, on a daily basis. But I, I tell you something, I just, um, last week, um, I'm a bit of a motorcycle guy and I hadn't driven a bikes for years. And, um, I had an old Honda that I hadn't driven 97 for years. And my brother called me one day and he wanted to buy it for his, um, for his son. His son works with him in the business and whatever. Anyway, so he bought this old bike and I've wanted to buy, um, you know, this whole summer I pull up to a light and I see some guy traveling across Canada driving a motorcycle. I think, and I haven't done this for years. I think, geez, that'd be sort of fun. You know, I haven't done something like that for years, you know. Anyway, so I found this uh, really minty um, BMW touring bike in Victoria and <laughs> broke the news to my wife on Monday that I'm flying out. <laughs> True story. I'm flying out. Hi, honey. I love you. And I didn't, you know, and I was I know I should have told her a little bit sooner, but, you know, it's one of those difficult kind of things, conversations you don't always want to have, you know, so I put it on, put it on. I said, I'm flying out tomorrow morning to pick up a motorcycle in Victoria. She said, what? I said, anyway, so I picked up this really nice BMW touring bike in Victoria on Tuesday morning. Yeah. Drove, drove it back here. Oh, yeah. How was that? Oh, it was awesome. It was hot. It was very hot. As a matter of fact, when you called me, I was just, I had it at um, Innovative Cycle on Logan Avenue getting um, uh, safety done on it. Oh, yeah. And um, I was just picking it up. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I drove it over to mother-in-law's place, lifted here and grabbed my wife's car and, and, and yeah, here yeah. I am. So yeah, so look, I spent some time in, in Arizona, uh, um, but I only go for, I go for about three weeks at a time. After that, I'm, um, I'm getting kind of antsy. I like to come back, spend a couple of days on the business and go on. So come back, see how things are going. We, we, technology is really good nowadays. I have an app on my phone. It gives me real-time info. Perfect. Yeah, so I know exactly I know exactly what's going on on a minute by minute basis, sales, this sort of thing, whatever. Also, I do one more thing. I've been doing it for years. The closing supervisor every night has to phone me with the numbers at the end of the shift. Okay. So whoever's closing that night, seven days a week, they call me and they give me, and we have a report. It's called the key factors report. And in that report, they fill it out manually. It's not generated by the computer. And it could be generated by the computer, but it's not. They fill it out, and I like that. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> they have to put in the cars, the complaints, how many exteriors, the upgrades, the detailed dollars, the labor, the net sales, a whole bunch of things. So they call me every night to give me the key factors report. And the reason I want them to call me is I want that closing supervisor to know that they have to report to somebody at the end of the day. What's the labor cost? How many cars do we wash? What were the complaints? Have any big customer problems? Mm -hmm. It's part of the people in respect what you inspect. Right. So, and, and I mean, I've had friends of mine, and I remember a comment and one time I was in Arizona a meeting with some friends of ours and the phone calls start coming in right at eight o'clock when we close. And th this nice lady, a good friend of ours, she said to Kim, you know, can't they run that business without phoning them every night? And Kim says, no, you don't understand. He wants to be called. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I want them to know that they have to report to somebody. And it gives me a chance to get the drift of what happened that day, any big issues. And I can say, okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Now, the odd time, I, depending on what I'm doing, I can't pick the phone up. I can't pick it up. But I try to pick it up every single time I can. Because I don't want the person on the other end of the phone. If they phone me too many times, I don't pick it up. They're not going to phone me anymore. 
right? So if you're going to make a commitment and make them do something, you better make the commitment back to do it, right? So, yeah. Anyway, so, yeah, so they call me. Yeah. <laughs> is it a pain? Sure it is, like but it. I like to hear about the business. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that falls kind of into the the realm of, of routine. So is there anything else or your routine guy, like uh, uh, on a daily basis, or are there any other parts that have become uh, habitual that have led to some of your, some success? I always try and shake people's hands. Trademark. I've been doing it for years, for years and years and years. Hi, how you doing? You know what I mean? And I remember, I remember one time when, in Domo, we operated gas bars in Saskatchewan, Alberta, BC, Manitoba. And I remember one time talking to one of my city managers in Saskatoon, a nice lady we had working for us. And um, she showed up at um, one of her stores and she was telling me the story afterwards. And she said, the person working said, some guy came here and was asking me all kinds of questions about the wash and, or about the gas bar and saying hello. And um, she said, well, did he shake your hand? And they said, yeah, he shook my hand. She said, oh, that's Dave. So that's sort of been a trademark, you know? Mm -hmm. And so if there's anything being in business, I, I think, you know, you try and get up in the morning and put a smile on your face and, and, and look in the mirror and realize that you're responsible for everything that's going to happen. And if it ain't running right, you're the lead dog and you better look at the lead dog, you know? I remember I said to my dad when he was, my dad died when he was about 83 of cancer. It was unfortunate. He was getting a little grumpy near the end there, you know? And, and I, I said, how are you doing today? And this was even before he knew he was dying, just getting a little bit more grumpy when he got older. And I said, Dad, I said, you're still alive. I said, put a smile on your face. I said, have a positive influence on somebody's life today. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, when you go to the bank, he said, tell the teller you really appreciate the business. Thank you. Put a smile on your face. You know, and I think sort of being in business is a little bit like that. We get wrapped up in the, it's sort of, sort of like being a young parent. You get wrapped up in no sleep and no this and no that. And it's like, and, you know, you got to, you got to, um, uh, you know, like you said, sort of not see individual trees, but look at the whole forest. And, and it's a little bit like that. Uh, you know, just look at the big picture, try and put a smile on your face and have a positive influence on somebody's life today and, and mm -hmm. go in, you know, if you go into your operation and you're grumpy and miserable, I mean, your people are only going to be as, as good as you are. And if you're not being positive, they're not going to be positive. Am I perfect? No, not even close. Do I try? Yeah, I do. Can I be better? Sure, absolutely. So I think it's like sort of giving yourself a tune-up every so often, you know? Yeah. You know, it's like, hey, are you doing the best job you you can do today? Are you? And when you and when you're running the when you're running any business, and I didn't learn this too. I mean, people have said this before. I mean, what you have, if you're not if you're not washing cars, then you're the only thing you have is your calendar. And it's what are you going to do with your time? What are you going to spend it on? Mm -hmm. You're going to spend it on working with your people or working with your customers or whatever. So you have your calendar. So you got to decide, okay, what's my calendar? And back to your original thing about, uh, about a balance in my life. I, I, I do pretty well. With a, you know, I, I, I have some hobbies that I like to do. I like boating, I like snowmobiling. I like motorcycles, go to Phoenix. So I do well. I have no complaints. <laughs> Great. As long as I can relax when I'm there. Yeah. Which is sometimes hard to do when you got a business too, right? You know what I mean? Because you're always concerned about it. No, I, yeah. I, I get it. I, uh, you mentioned handshaking. I remember the first time that I introduced my nine-year-old son. I, I don't think he, it was yeah. probably a few years ago. Yeah. It could have been seven, eight. Yeah. I introduced him yeah. to somebody. Yeah. And he put out his hand and said, hi, nice to meet you. Yeah. And shook his hand. Isn't that awesome? And I was like, yes. yes. Well, that's training. Yeah. That's training. I, yeah. I went through the same thing with my son when he was about eight or nine one time, two or 10. We were down at uh, Winnipeg Motorsports. I think he was buying like a dirt bike or something. And, um, you know, salesman came up to talk to him and he said, hi, I'm Ryan, you know, and I let him go in. This is a true story. I let him go in that room and make that deal on that bike himself. Mm -hmm. I figured, you know what? He's got to learn. Let him go make the bike. And I added the deal and I, we had a rough idea and we talked about, you know, how much you should probably pay for it roughly. And he went and made the deal. And then he didn't have quite enough money. So it, and it was Winnipeg Motorsports at the time. Maybe it was called Winnipeg Yamaha. The guy's name owned it was... Ted and Elvin, I think it was Ted. And he and my son Ryan didn't quite have enough money. So he made a deal with Ted that he could pay him this much, but by by two weeks you would have more, he could give him the balance. Eh? So he let him take the bike. <laughs> you know? So I mean, yeah, that's, that's good. It's good training. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So trying to be respectful of your time, I really appreciate okay. you coming and sharing no this. Um, what is something, you know, the phrase, you, you, you don't know what you don't know. So is there anything that I should have asked you or that you wanted or that you even thought about when, uh, when you knew you were coming here that, uh, that you wanted to share? No, I don't think so. Not really. I just, I'm, I'm really appreciative of all the people that I've, that worked with me all these years, whether it's accountants or lawyers or, or my staff. And I mean, we've got a number of people, and I'm not going to throw all the names, but uh, who, who have spent, who've committed a lot of time, you know, and work every day, come to work every day uh, to make the business work. And, uh, you know, we try to look after them and, and pay them well, but um uh, I sure appreciate all the work everybody's done over all these years, you know, and it's sure nice to see them successful. You know, it's nice to see, um, you know, uh, 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 one of my managers I mentioned before, Kyle Thompson. I mean, he lived in a nicer home than I did for a number of years. You know, I mean, I was in the same place for 30 something years. It was time yeah. to move anyways, yeah. but yeah. I did move eventually. But yeah, so I mean, seeing your people do really well is uh, is a really important thing because if your people do well, you're going to do well, period. Bottom line. If your people do well, you're going to do well. Uh, one last question. Yep. What is something that you would impart on the 18-year-old? I got a really good school? one. Every day you come to work, treat the business like it was your own business. And if you treat the business like it was your own business, people will recognize that and you will do well and you will move up. And, and, and I did that right from the get-go. When I, you know, I, I treated the business like it was my own business. That's how much I cared about it. And whether it was delivering papers or cutting grass or working for Domo or McDonald's or whatever, treat the business like it was your own. Care about it that much. Because here's the, and this is what I tell people too. You're going to put a day's work in. You're going to put a week's work in. You're going to put a month's work in. Why not? Do your very best every single minute that you're working, because what you're going to get out of it at the end of your life is a ton more than if you just go through slacking or not doing everything you can. Mm -hmm. And I tell people, I realize that your best today maybe wasn't as good as your best yesterday, but that's the most you can put out today for whatever reason. But just try and put out your best every day. And whether you're a parent or, um, you know, whatever, just try and do the best job you can every day. And, and sometimes, you know, you give yourself a tune up and say, geez, I didn't handle that very well. Another thing I did, another interesting thing I did, I learned through the years, I would look at situations when I worked for other people, I would watch how they handled situations. And if they handled it really good, I would remember, hey, that's a good way to handle this situation. If they didn't handle the situation good, I said, well, don't do that again. So learn from other people also, eh? Mm -hmm. But the biggest thing is just treat the business and treat your job like it was your own. And you know, at the end of your life, you'll be a lot further ahead than you would be if you just coasted through life, you know? I think that one thing that that does is it will make you invaluable to the company. Well, and that's yeah, exactly. 100%. And, and not only yes. will you be paid more, but you will find yourself with so many more options. Yeah, and you'll feel much better about yourself too, and you'll do better. Like I, I've always done really well. It's um, I've always made good money, and I've always done really well. And uh, the only th and and it's not because of uh, you know an IQ score or whatever. I've, I've never even taken one of those IQ tests. You know, and I was reading something the other night about about they were relating IQs to success, and some of the worst people in history have a huge IQs. Like huge, mm -hmm. but they, they didn't use them. It doesn't make any difference. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's 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 in this in so it's you're in control of what's between the ears, right? You're in control, yeah, and and you and you got to like I said, get up every morning and, and say, look, I'm going to do the best job I can and uh, try and make a positive impact on people's life. And as you get older, you even realize that more and more. Like we've got four grandchildren. I love them all to death. They're so much fun. And we've had a huge impact on on their upbringing in the sense they spend a lot of time with us. So 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 you try and have a positive impact on those kids and set them off in the right way. Their parents and you, because you you can have a huge influence. You know? Yeah. You know, I'm very proud of the fact that we taught each one of our grandchildren how to shoot straws at the restaurant. 
you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. seriously, <laughs> that's the most hilarious thing, you know, you know, most deadliest marksmen out there. Oh yeah. It's great. And we, each one of them, you know, I mean, you know, two of my grandchildren, when they were younger and maybe the other ones, we bought them slingshots and we used to go down the creek beside the house and shoot rocks into the water. I like so, it. I mean, yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you can, you gotta have, you gotta have some fun too, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, I really appreciate you coming out and sharing your story and, uh, imparting some of the, the wisdom that's come with a, uh, a long career and one that, uh, probably doesn't look like it's, uh, going to be ending anytime soon, really. No, I'm going to be like these old good people that you see them sometimes, you know, hobbling into work in their 90s. Because I don't have anything else to do, to be honest with you. <laughs> you know, like Clint Eastwood was a good, you know, these guys like 90 something years old still making movies. You know, that's what he does. That's yeah. what I do. You know, I mean, I might change my mind someday. I might get to some point and say, oh, I just don't want to, you know, do this that much anymore. So then we'll look at options. But yeah. for right now, I'm still good. So well, as long as you enjoy it, you yeah. keep doing that. Yeah. Okay, well, I appreciate you coming on and you can come back anytime you want. Dan, pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs>